you'd like to contact the show, send us an email at liveonfourlegspodcast at gmail.com or get involved in the conversation on social media. Join the Pearl Jam Podcast community group on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Live on Four Legs Pod. You know, we've been kind of playing for a number of years at this point, and uh, I know we've had a number of gigs in this part of the world, this part of our country, but uh, we tried to make the right decisions in, uh, in regards to you, in regards to ourselves, and in regards to ourselves as community members and the whole deal. And sometimes we were right, sometimes we figured it out better the next time, but uh, I don't know what we did to get this kind of response from you, and we really do appreciate it. I mean, I wasn't here for it, but I don't even think Michael Jordan got this fucking response when he gave it. And away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring... Mr. Stone Gossett! Fucking camera in the truck. now welcome to live on four legs a definitive live pearl jam podcast and if you tuned in for the first time welcome we are a show that covers a lot of pearl jam shows going back to the early 90s the mid 2000s and even current day today we are going to do a show from 2008 and it is our final show covering the deep series the deep catalog that was just released about a month ago on pearl jam's website that gives you the free bootlegs Amazing. If you have Spotify, if you have Apple Music, you go to the website, you can listen to all the songs. We've been doing the last couple of years. We did 2013 last week with Spokane. We did 2003 with Buffalo. We did 2000 with Montreal. And we even did the Leeds 2014 show. So it's been a theme that we've been doing the past month. And this is the last one. 2008, Washington, D.C. Surprisingly enough, this was the last show to date. That the band has done in Washington, D.C. So, for all of you that live in the nation's capital, this is the last time that you've had a chance to really celebrate Pearl Jam. And hopefully, they can go back there in the future. However, we got an episode to do. Randy Sobel over here. John Farr over there. Hello. Hi. So, it is kind of weird that they haven't been to D.C. since yeah, 2008, that's, right? 13 that's surprising. years. surprising. Yeah, they did... They did Baltimore, twenty thirteen, and mm-hmm. Charlottesville, but just skipped right over DC. Yeah, and for such a for a place that was such a huge part of the nineties, yeah, think of those ninety five and ninety eight, like yeah, that's surprising. Very rich history of shows. Like the ninety five shows are like the first live audience ones with Jack, and the ninety eight they did the Tibetan Freedom concert at yeah. uh, RFK Stadium. This this crowd is great too. There's it can't be anything with this crowd. This crowd is amazing. Oh yeah, and they say it throughout. Like this, yeah. this is this area, and usually most East Coast places are going to have very good crowds. And this is kind of like, yeah, it's north of the Mason Dixon line, so it still has that. You can pull in the the Jersey people, you can pull pull in the Philly people, and kind of get the mix of the hometown crowd that's very passionate as well. Uh, yeah, it, it has all of those elements that you like to have from your crowd. So it is, it is a little bit weird that they haven't gone back there. And I wonder if it's always been sort of a, uh, cause you have to think May of 2010, they did Bristow, Virginia. You have to think like, you know, May, April, the times that they're going to be there sometimes are during like hockey and basketball playoff season. So maybe it might be tougher to book 
you know, Washington, D.C., because the Capitals are usually in the playoffs, the Wizards possibly in the playoffs. So maybe that had something to do with it. But it is a little strange, 13 years, and they haven't been back to yeah. the nation's capital. Yeah, that's that is weird. You know what was interesting, though? 2008, this wasn't the last, so to speak, uh, Pearl Jam presence in Washington, D.C., because Eddie actually did two shows there and filmed a lot of content for the Water on the Road uh, mm-hmm. DVD. Yep, very cool. And there's, yeah, that's Brendan Canty from Fugazi was there, comes out and does a little uh, thing. You know, D.C., of course, the home of Fugazi. I'm always going to mention that. But yeah, that Water on the Road DVD is great. I think that was just the next year, right? 20, 2009 or 2011? Yeah, it was... This. It was released in 2011, but it was recorded those days. And I think I went back. I I actually listened to this and I kind of had it on the background. What was interesting, because I didn't realize when they released it until afterwards, but I thought to myself, there was kind of a demo version of Unthought Known on it. And I'm wondering if that's like the first ever thing that they did. If that's like Eddie's original version of that. Probably. Because it was originally called Unknown Thought, I think, the original right. demo, and then they they flipped it. So, yeah, that could be. Yeah, so. Makes sense. Um, yeah. Anything else about this show? Like, we've done 2008 shows before. It feels like, you know, this, this year is pretty unpredictably predictable in a way where they're going to bust out the rare songs, and you kind of know that from, you know, seeing in, in 2020 hindsight, you know that there's songs that are in heavy rotation that aren't usually in heavy rotation, songs like Who You Are that get played at the show, and songs that aren't played at the show like WMA and All Night, and a couple others that kind of come to mind from those MSG and the Bonnaroo shows. Uh, but, like, they are definitely, and, and you can tell from this set list, they're mixing things up a lot. And, you know, they're not really touring for an album. So they have the ability to just kind of throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Exactly, yeah. Whenever they do these tours that are kind of like the last gasp of of the the tour of the record before they, they go back into hiding and, you know, go to go back to the studio, you always get cool stuff. And this is a good one if you like trilogies. Let's just put it that way. Yes. And uh, there's a really good disparity of, of album influence here. Like, you have... I'm looking at it now. Lost Dogs. I feel like every show in 2008, just because this is more of a rare tour, every show has the most amount of songs off of Lost Dogs. So this actually has five. And then the next is four with ten. And then you have five albums that have three songs that were uh, that were played from those albums, and then Yield has two, and Vitalgy has one. So look at all these albums. You got Riot Act by Gnarl versus No Code, and the self-titled Avocado record all have three songs from them. That's that's a really cool disparity. Like you don't get that anymore. Yeah, almost everything's represented. It's, it's cool. It's weird to see Vitalogy down there with only one. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of the outlier. And, and that usually doesn't happen because the two that you think are pretty obvious, you only get one of those two. So mm-hmm. that's that's kind of like that when we did. Uh, didn't the lead show only have one Vitalogy song? Wasn't that there term was just one. There was one that we did recently? Yeah. 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 So it, we, we've been Vitalogy light lately. I wonder if we have to go to a 1995 show. Oh, maybe hmm. we will. Hmm. Maybe we will do that very soon. More on that at some point in the future. But uh, yeah, this is, again, like they're still kind of touring off avocado. You know, there's avocado influence in this, but it's not, you're not getting all those worldwide suicide life wasted songs right off the bat like you usually do. There's one and it's kind of the one that is really stuck around off the album. Actually, the three songs that are played at the show are more the ones that have stuck around off Avocado, which is very yeah, interesting. That, and that just goes to show by this time, two years later, a lot of those had started to kind of fall by the wayside. They That's weren't right. really doing Unemployable that much very mm-hmm. often. They weren't doing Parachutes anymore very often. Even like Inside Job hadn't really come and like had the, the prominence that it does now. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like you said, Life, life Wasted and Worldwide Suicide, like – they're around, but they're not nearly as prevalent in 2008 as they were in 2006. 
Right, right. Let's get the show started. Let the show begin. And the way that we're going to begin, like I kind of mentioned before, there were things that were happening in 2008 that they kept going back to the well with that were just sticking, that were working, that were really gelling, that people and fans had been asking for for a long time. And this is actually very important because opening the show and that opened the show five times on this 2008 tour, hard to imagine. is important right now because very recently last thursday we released a hard to imagine evolution episode over on our patreon so you know there there might have been some influence uh picking the show to to say hey we can kind of package the two things together and uh, exactly it worked out pretty well especially we talked a lot about this becoming an opening track and we'll give you a little bit of a preview for that now. If we can sell you on going to Patreon, spending one dollar, you all you gotta do is spend one dollar to listen to this episode, and maybe some of the other really, really good Evolution episodes too, on Immortality and Present Tense and Rearview Mirror and some of those other songs. But this one, very interesting history, and what we're we don't want to waste all of it, but let's talk about its history being an open. In 2005, they kind of bring it back after the Gord show. It hadn't been played before the Gord show for a very long time. They bring it back. That show, everybody's kind of like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, outdoor venue in one of the best venues on, in the country. Great moment during kind of that opening sequence. And then it gets played a lot during that Canadian tour. And in Halifax, on that Canadian tour, it gets open with for the first time ever. It doesn't get played too, too often between 2005 and 2008, but in 2008, they start to bring it back. In the five times that they played it, they were all opening tracks. Yeah, they really went with that. Like, you don't usually see that. I mean, you think of Pendulum in 2013, but... There's not really another one that's like tied to a time, but when you see Hard to Imagine Opener, you think, oh, 2008. And it gave them kind of a chance to really dig in on the song and really just work on it and get it nailed down. And some these are some of the best versions. I think we, we talked about the one from Mansfield being incredible, and this one's, this one's right there with it. Because the song had never really gotten a chance like that where it was played show after show after show like five shows out of 15 or whatever it never had that chance so they finally were in a rhythm with it and went a groove in it and it sounds unbelievable this 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 version is really really good
comparison that you can make with this song and other opening songs kind of in their pantheon of, of openers is that it kind of has the same trajectory that release has where it kind of starts off and it kind of has you in a little bit of a trance inducing moment where you're just kind of feeling the vibes of the song and it's a very warm song like the way that the song progresses it, it just feels like the melody is just beautiful and you kind of get lost in it a little bit so it continues to build and when it has that big build and Ed comes in with those vocals that just shatter the limits of his expectations on his voice like that's when the song gets fantastic and it has that comparison with release where you get that big moment that I'll ride the way like this comes in and you're, things are different you know that that's such a massive major moment especially because there's so many people that are going to shows in this era that have not seen this song live. And when you're busting out with it, like right out of the gate, people that have been going to these shows for years, like say, say there are people that went to the whole 2006 or 2003 tour, they probably hadn't seen this live. So for a lot of people, this is kicking them right into the show and it, it's hitting them in such a hard spot that... Uh, you know, like, it's really, it's for the fans. It's for the ultimate fans. Yeah, and it's such a cool thing for them. Like you said, they're kind of at the end of an album cycle, so they're on this tour. They can, they feel like they can kind of do whatever they want, try some different things, and this is just one thing, and I'm I'm sure, you know, I, I don't know if it was Ed or Stone or someone else was like, why don't, we, uh, why don't we try hard to imagine a few times here? And they probably did it once, liked it, and yeah, it's just... It's one of those perfect opening songs that like it like sucks you in with that little guitar riff. By the time you get to that, you know, that crash and like you said when the song opens up and everything kind of comes crashing down, it's a wonderful wonderful moment and super special. I'm jealous of the people that got to see this tour because getting this as an opener would have been amazing. It and I think that it it kind of it puts the show on a high for the first few songs. I think the songs that follow it benefit from having hard to imagine in front of it. Like it, it absolutely. makes those songs better. Yeah, I I have to agree with you absolutely. Uh, it just because I think it just it sets a mood. It sets a mood, and the the mood there is that you've got to hear something that you almost never get to hear. And not only that, but it was a super passionate version, a super passionate moment. They uh, the killed mic, it. Yeah, yeah, the mic solo is fantastic in it, and it just has this beautiful way about it. Uh, like I, it's a sneaky top twenty song. We talked about it in the episode. We couldn't say enough positive things about it. And if you liked what we had to say about it here and you want to hear us talk about it more patreon.com slash live on four legs or search live on four legs on the patreon app it's the evolution episode hard to imagine and we've done 14 of them now and they just seem to keep getting better and better and i thought that this one was really cool because it has this like rags to riches story that it starts from basically nothing and turns into this this song that we just mentioned that has yeah, all of these I mean incredible moments in it it's it's the only one i can think of where you actually get to hear it just the the original germ of the i just a two second guitar thing from stone that that turned into this song and it's we, you get to follow the whole journey of it it was really really fun yep it's a powerful song and it kind of gives you that out of body experience in the same way that some of those other openers do i i think it's it's elite tier opener along with release 100 percent. and uh like you said it it makes the rest of the stuff here feel even better feel even larger and it kind of gets the band loosened up a little bit knowing that the the crowd has really responded to to them opening up with this so they go into severed hand hail hail do the evolution and uh it's early energy in this in the show last week we talked about severed hand kind of being in that encore spot sort of floating around here uh in 2006 they would play it more around the three or the four but in the two is is pretty common for it as well and uh it, it's it's backbone by the great version of hail hail and a really good version of of do the evolution too i do the evolution actually more than really good the, the lyrical inflections on it were fantastic were some of the best like at least of the era the way that ed's kind of belting out those those lyrics at the end oh my god <laughs>
sometimes talk about, you know, you can feel when a song kind of surges forward, when you feel the band kind of like lean into it and like, okay, we're going to push this a little bit. And you kind of feel the energy, you know, even coming off the bootleg. I think Severed Hand and Hail Hail, you could you could feel it. Like these are, these are there was a little extra something behind these these versions, I think. And I was a little bit of a, a hangover from Hard to Imagine in a good way. But they were still feeling some of the energy of that, the end of Hard to Imagine that kind of carried over. And these are you know, some of the best, you know, performances of Severed Hand and Hail Hail I've heard in a long time. And uh, do the evolution as well, I think. You'll see, I think if we end up doing a, a Evolution episode on Do the Evolution, you'll see that after, I think after 2005 and after those South American versions, it really, really jumped forward in their mind. It really kind of got off on the front foot and he really started getting into it. And yeah, this, this is another really good version. And again, Do the Evolution this early is always great. Gets the crowd going. Yeah, I, I happen to like Do the Evolution here uh, in the early part of the set more than I do when they kind of close with it. I, I, I think it can work. It's one of those rare songs that can work anywhere, but it's one you want to get jumping, you want to get going with it early on. Like there's other songs that you can throw in here that do the same thing, but won't elicit the same exact reaction. I think yeah. Do the Evolution is one of those rare songs that wherever you put it in the set, you're going to get the reaction that you usually get from the song. So, yeah, uh, there's one thing I want to bring up that Mike just has a very specific sound out of his guitar at this show, and it's kind of rubbing off of some of these versions here, and it kind of lingers through the rest of the show. It's very good. Yeah, it's a thick, like, rich, like, full yeah. guitar sound great on this. Right. Uh, I mean, obviously the one that is going to have the most of that sound is going to be even flow, but yeah. it, it, it really does pick up the set in such a good way. Really quick, it doesn't really talk a lot at this show, but, you know, small things that he does says, or okay, uh, it's not it's not a great speech night for Ed or anything like that. But uh, I, I I think the less talk, more rock aspect of the show really works for it. But it says good evening. We have a makings of a good show in D.C. tonight. Lots of emotions going on in the world and the country. Things are good. Things are bad. Things can get better. You guys have a lot to do with it. This one's from Mount Pleasant, and uh, this is where you get a really fantastic sing along with Elderly Woman, and. Uh, you know, even to the point where, like, Ed is sort of communicating with the crowd mid song. All life times are catching on with me. You agree? All these changes they place. I wish I'd seen the place, but no one's ever taken me. The crowd sounded great, and it's funny the the Mount Pleasant reference because that's I think the Evens were a thing by this point. They put out one or two albums. They had a song called Mount Pleasant on on one of their first albums, and then he shouts out Ted Leo. I think opened the show also from DC, so a little bit, a couple of little cool DC uh, references there, but. Yeah, I thought, you know, and usually evolution into small town would be weird, but I think, like I said, they, they, you needed the that crowd moment to get everybody back into it. So, yeah, that sounded great. Another kind of kind of an upbeat, kind of, a, you know, small town, you know, it's, it's not the, the folky version that you sometimes get, you know, to the to the back of the audience or in an encore. This is kind of a, an early set small town, had a different feel to it. Yeah, it was somewhere in between anthemic and yeah. sing-along. And I think it worked. I thought it was really good. Uh, in between, though, Ed's, cool. this is kind of, yeah, right. Is this foretelling or, or uh, what? Uh, this one's about when you make the wrong decision, you find yourself in the wrong place, and it was all your fault, and sometimes you have to admit you made the wrong decision and change that decision and admit you're wrong. This song's called Evacuation. Show! 
the bat, it really wasn't going to work. So they indeed, like Ed said, they had to evacuate it. They gave it a they gave it a the old college try. Like yeah. they, it fell apart. They tried to get it back together, and yeah, just not just not working. There's only a you know this sometimes happens with like mankind or some of like the more Seems offbeat bad. ones. Yeah, but just a a tough song to play. So I, I get it, but maybe there's there's a reason that this song shows up once a year, once every other year. Right, and they didn't even get to any of the bridges in the song. That's how yeah. you know that they, they were really they struggling with part. this one. Yeah, I I think the problem was with something with Mike's guitar because Mike either was completely lost after the intro or he had the wrong guitar and there was something off tune mm. out, uh, out of it anyway, but I wasn't hearing any of Mike in my left ear at all. Yeah, I think it's one of the things where he was looking around, like he probably just gave up and was looking around <laughs> to try to find, you know, it's one of those songs where you try to find the one, right? Like right. Every, you, you try to find the beat, like let me find the beat of one and I'll be okay. Right. And this is just one of those weird songs where it, it's in one of those weird time signatures like, okay, and there's the one. Nope, missed it. Uh, there it is. Now, yeah, he, he was probably just like standing around and lost. However, I, I, I think it was, you know, the band did the right thing, not trying to get through a haphazard version of it. It's early in the show. You don't want to make asses of yourself early in the show, and they did it the right way. They were just like, ah, let's leave it. Our next song is Corduroy. You guys are more interested in that anyway. Let's just kind of leave that to be what it is. It wasn't the full song. It was about a minute and a half worth, and that's fine because they obviously didn't have it, but at the end, they kind of were just like, all right, well, fuck it. It kind of had that like free jazz almost finish to it where they were just kind of fucking around with it if yeah it just falls apart and yeah they're they're like we always say they're adorable when they fuck up like you can't be mad at them they don't no one got mad on stage like no No. one threw their guitar down and walked off there wasn't like a screaming match on stage so yeah it's just like all right well we gave it a try we'll we'll move on right corduroy they they have a good attitude about it we kind of know corduroy just a little bit better and uh and they end up like corduroy's a showstopper so of course they follow up and they know they have to make good on on their mistake and and they do and it gets you know what i thought kind of about this version was that it kind of had that feel to it when right when they're about to kind of at the end just rev back up into the finishing part it really builds it really gets into some juice of this version where you kind of if you're there live you're sort of kind of jumping around with it you're about to kind of wait for the moment to explode and it just has that perfect build to get to that moment i i thought this was a magnificent version to to exemplify that specifically hmm um it's very good at the end. I'll give you that. It it really got the, the really. That's good what I'm specifically end. referring to. Yeah, yes. yeah. But th- I thought this was way too fast. And this song, it it just loses like some muscle when it's played too fast. Like it needs to be paced the right way. And I know I'm, you know, deep fans of the podcast will will think I'm I'm doing a bit. But uh, like picture like a bodybuilder, like one of those super muscle dudes trying to run sprints, and you're just like this just. This is not what you're good at. Just, just leave, leave that to the other people. Like, it felt, it felt too fast. It felt rushed. Doesn't need to have the same bases. Impact, I think. Maybe. I don't know if I picked up on that. Corduroy is one of those where, like, I can, I can dig it at any speed. I don't mind. So. Sure. Yeah, not, not terrible. Just I don't think it, it didn't have the same kind of impact and the same muscle and the same kind of bite that it normally has. In, that, that, there's going to be another one a few songs later we're going to talk about I'm going to talk about that the, the same way but yeah kind of a kind of a one of the themes of the show a little bit this section that we get into now something i don't think they've done before i don't think they've done since this is the i section i me mine referring to the first person i'm open into i am mine into i got shit we have never seen these three songs in a row before i'm open only been played 13 times so you almost never get that to begin with and they're just kind of it's 2008 they're just throwing shit at the ball seeing if it works and this feels like the tee up 
for what's coming to be later because the one later they're both fan fantastic but the one later feels like okay you know this is a thing and they're kind of making it apparent that it would be a thing nobody mentions ed doesn't say anything ed doesn't say hey this is for all of you i people out there they, they just kind of do it and if, if you're savvy yeah. enough to pick up on it then then you did if if not then uh later you might go back and look at the set and see what they did in a couple songs later and be like oh okay i see what they were going for there i see what they're going for uh, there. Yeah, yeah well done well done yeah this is one of those like you it's all it's just kind of staring you in the face it's there but you never think of these songs together as a trilogy no. but here they are i think they did it in the right order I think this I agree. is this is the way to do it, mm-hmm. and yeah, I think it's it's well done. I mean, I, I'm open as obviously you're you know you're never gonna get the album version where he's goes off on that that spoken word thing, but it's kind of cool. Like it it reminds me a little bit of that you know that Fargo 2003 version of In My Tree where they came back and just kind of like played the one riff and he just kind of like improved over it and just kind of made up some stuff and it ended up being really poignant and really kind of beautiful and great. And I thought this this I'm open is really good. I mean, this is they had brought it back. I think what 2006 they had finally started playing or 2005. So yep, it was kind of in this era. So they it wasn't the first time they'd done it, which could be kind of awkward. So this is the fifth. And yeah, I thought it was great. And I mean, I am mine. You know, I always talk about I am mine. Like, please, like let let this be the one where it where wasn't. it opens up and it's not. Yeah, but it wasn't. But I got shit is is the highlight. I think that you, you build uh, you build the I got shit here, and it's it's an A plus fantastic um, version. Easily, I got shit is the highlight, yeah. um, and that's not to say that I'm open and I mine weren't great because I thought that they both were yeah. really yeah. good additions to the set. But I got shit was just kind of just out of the stratosphere of the other two. Um, you just have Matt driving the pace while Mike is able to just go off again. And the Ed vocal run at the end sounds fantastic. And I think that's going to con- kind of come back into play in a song or two later that I kind of thought, hey, that sort of sounds like what he usually does. And I got shit. But the way that it ends where Matt is just, oh, my God, just completely drilling a hole in time into a snare that was a really really good really good ending of that song like I, I usually they can go off and they can kind of tear this at the end but they tore this song a new asshole at the end of it. it was fan fantastic <laughs> mentioned that a couple of times this is a really good ed show is and sounds really good voices in great form but yeah i got shit is it's it's just one of those songs where like everything comes together at the end and it it makes something really special like it it's it elevates to greater the sum is greater than the parts it's similar to hard to imagine a little bit where the song kind of crashes open at the at the end and it they just you get kind of lost in it and it's one of those like cool transcendent moments this is fantastic great what great I, I love this thing i, I wish they would uh, i wish they would do this more often play these three together when we get into the next trilogy we can talk about some of the other trilogies that you guys pitched to us on uh, on twitter and facebook that we talked about a little bit we can we can talk about some of those and we can talk about our plans to kind of create more of a, yeah. a definitive trilogy collection so to speak but uh this was definitely a good way to start the first of the two so that gets us into a version of Daughter that is back to back with Light Years here, and I really like the combo. I think the two songs really work work off of each other really well. Uh, you know, very poppy, very upbeat. Uh, the Daughter tag was just excellent build. 
the hey ho let's go call and response was very good it kind of has the like a little bit of a plucky piece of the rhythm of stone that kind of keeps building towards the end and it doesn't really have whenever they do the the blitzkrieg bop it, it's not a substantial tag necessarily but it gets a good crowd reaction and it, it's more I, I feel like Ed just kind of doing it as a call and response and letting the band speak for itself at the end of the song instead of trying to turn the song into something else like they would do with WMA or, or anything else. Right, yeah, the crowd is is up for this. They sound fantastic. And I think it was it was Stone who was getting like a little funky on the, you know, right before that, a little like kind of a little staccato guitar riff there. It sounded it sounded very cool. Yeah, I think I like you know I like this. And you know, you're you're bookending the kind of the weird trilogy of songs that don't get played very often. With you know, you, you start off corduroy, then you get into it, then you're coming out of it with daughters. So it's not like you're you you might have lost some people, but then you, oh we're we're getting right back into it. So here's another one that people know. So again, very very good set list construction here to kind of bookend that with with some of the more popular songs. But Light Years is the one like the other one for me that was just played too fast. It just didn't sound like it normally does it needs the right pace to have that bite and to to get that impact behind it and just didn't have it into this one for me yeah i, I actually like this version of light years i i, I kind of thought that yeah maybe it was a little bit too fast but it differentiated between other versions that kind of have that that groove pace and it kind of felt like maybe there wasn't a moment for it maybe there wasn't an Weirdly, they, they played Come Back at this show, too, so I wonder if something was on their mind, if somebody had just passed, because playing these two songs in one show is, is kind of interesting, but they were both yeah. not necessarily, like, ones that are tear-inducing or, like, just emotionally inducing, and I think that's okay. I think that's fine, because I really love the vocal runs that Ed was doing in this. You can hear a, whole, a lot of passion out of his voice, a lot of these songs, and this is where he was kind of at the end doing sort of the same thing that he did with I Got Shit. He was kind of doing that, nah, 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 like that kind of, that kind of stuff at the end. I don't think I've ever heard him do that on like this before. I thought that that was interesting, and that was me. Okay, interesting. Yeah, for me, it just, it, it just didn't have the, the power and the emotion behind it that it normally does. That's fair. Look, it's, it's out of, it's out of era. It's, you know, eight years past it's uh, prime, so to speak, but to get it in a 2008 show feels like you're getting something a little bit different, a little bit uh, sub- more substantial than getting the stuff that you usually do get from this era. So at least you do get they, that. And they made it all the way through, which you couldn't say for the other binaural song that they tried. Exactly. So exactly. kudos for that. Right. We go into the ultimate hit here, and we go into Even Flow. And like I mentioned before, Mike's guitar tone is is very I, I, the what was the way that you mentioned it before because i can't remember how you were like talking thick and rich and full like it's very much so yeah, yeah. yep it had you know he busts out the usual incredible tricks the usual suspects are out and it's very loud like versions of even flow that you can tell are loud are like you can kind of feel it right away but this one was when you're sitting in front of the speaker you remember those old THX commercials where they sit in front of the speaker and their their hair is completely blown back like that was this version of Even Flow you don't get that every single version of this song sometimes it's just it's very good but doesn't blow you away necessarily I thought that this one blew you away more than normal versions do yeah very good and, and two, just like Daughter, Stone doing kind of an interesting counter melody Stone thing underneath. Nice job yeah, doing something. doing some things, some unique Easy. stuff underneath. So, yes, yeah, very, very interesting version. Good on good on both sides. Uh, speaking of both sides, uh, at, the, at the time, uh, there really wasn't much of a both sides because Republicans were, uh, were in control. And at the time... They were trying to get them out of control, and and very shortly after this, they would be out of control. And uh, Ed talked a lot about how uh, the administration wanted to allocate offshore drilling because everybody's spending $4 on gas right now. There are 40 million acres that that have already been allocated that they aren't using, and they're trying to get 70 million more acres that they're trying to drill when they already have this 40 million. The politicians are businessmen. We're the 
stockholders and we need to hold them accountable and uh, said it would be great to get some color into the White House. And I think it was around this time where everybody kind of knew that Obama was going to be the candidate and we were kind of we were going to get ready for something a little bit different in this country. So it's it's interesting. He teased this up a couple shows later. The first show that I went to in, at MSG, he sings at the end of Wishlist. He uh, kind of does this, I wish I was the vice president uh, with Obama. He's our man. Like, he's he's getting into it at the time, and he kind of sees a brighter tomorrow. And uh, you can tell within the next two albums that there is much more positivity than there was in the early 2000s albums. Yeah, a lot more kind of hopefulness behind it. But it's interesting. This that whole speech kind of gets um, gets a mixed reaction. Like I couldn't tell if if you know some people in the crowd were not into it, or if they just didn't want to hear him talk politics. If it was that kind of a right. crowd, but it's DC, there's they, some they get there's some it. there's some murmuring like in the crowd, like eh, we might not be behind this. But also, it was one of very few Ed moments like this. He doesn't have a lot of crowd addressing moments yeah. in this show so yeah, if it's, this it's is not a one, union dale fine. bush leaguer for sure it's not no. one of that but just a just a, i don't think he maybe got the the pat on the back that he was expecting no and and maybe he wasn't even expecting that maybe he didn't really yeah. give a shit about that maybe it was just on his mind needed to to get it off and and uh and that's it go to the next song because the next song kind of has a lot to do with what he just said it's green disease green disease a little janky, like a little bit more distorted than usual, a little bit muffled. It took me out of the song a little bit, but it wasn't mm. necessarily a bad version of it or anything like that. It just wasn't upper echelon, top tier green disease versions. And of course, it's yeah. it's out of 2003, so your expectations probably are a little bit lower for it. But you know, of, of a song that I like, I, I, I there's a certain there's a certain feel, a certain bounce that that I, I like to get from it. I didn't really feel that exact way here. Yeah, normally that you need that kind of ringing guitar to kind of get the feel of the song. I didn't feel like this one was all there with that one. But we haven't mentioned Jeff at all, and this I think Jeff was the the highlight on this one. The bass really sounded good, really growled, and really was uh he was leaning into it so that that was the that was the thing that stood out to me for this one but yeah another little uh little double riot act here yes and the way that we get to start talking about the second of the riot act is that we're in our second trilogy of the night and ed tees it up by saying we got the i section now the next three are all about you that is very very clever of course in the Pantheon, you think of Leather Man, Better Man, Nothing Man, and there have been additions to the man. I think Man of the Hour has been thrown on at the back end of that. Yeah, Once Alive Footsteps, obviously. Yeah, and that, that's, yeah. The, you know, not namesake, you know, but those three all always go together. Much later than this, you would get a family trilogy of Daughter, Mother, and My Father's Son was done, so I, done, I believe, in uh, Amsterdam in 2014. Not very often, but has been done. Let's share some of the ones that were shared with us on Twitter. We won't share all of them because we're going to do something with these. But we had, uh, and and sorry if I, I don't attribute this to, to people's names. I was just kind of haphazardly writing them down. But um, we have the Insect Trilogy of Bugs, Red Mosquito, and Bee Girl. Interesting. I like that. How about we call that the the pest control trilogy? The pest control trilogy. Yep. Um, how about the light trilogy? Light years, low light, and lightning bolt. Okay, that's good. That's a good one. Theory of relativity, speed of sound, supersonic, and light years. Ooh, okay, getting some. We got some right. scientists in the that's, in the crowd. That that's a good one. That's like that, a little academic in there. I like that. That was that was the that was the high IQ one. Yeah, <laughs> it compared yeah, to good. the rest of that's them. That's good. Uh, the name trilogy, Crazy Mary, Dirty Frank, Jeremy. Oh, you could go, you could go even deeper with that one. You got Pilot and Lucan, Mm -hmm. Johnny Guitar. Oh yeah. Yeah. The All series, which of course has to end with one note. Um, All Night, All Those Yesterdays and All or None. Okay. Cool. And all good songs. That those, those, that would be that would be three interesting ones to hear back to back to back. We'll share one more for you here. How about the negative series? Not for you. Nothing, man. Nothing as it seems. 
negativity. Mm-hmm. Someone, someone not feeling so positive about things. That's maybe uh, <laughs> we could come up with a positive trilogy to to balance that one. Yeah, I think there are positives and and maybe more negatives and maybe more positive, positive. <laughs> Uh, look, I have about 30 that are sitting here and after this episode comes out, probably the next day we'll be releasing a Debo episode over on our Patreon that will be coming up with the definitive list of all the trilogies that we can come up with. So we'll be trying to, we're going to go as deep as we can. We're going to try to get all of them. We're going to try to get all of them. And if we don't, then hold us accountable and please reach out to us. But, uh, that'll be on our Patreon, patreon.com slash live and four legs. Now let's get into the U series here. And, uh, you are kicks this off. Like we mentioned, they're, they're riot act songs back to back. And, uh, does it ever feel like Mike really has, screeching solos at the end of this like this yeah, i almost really. feel like we never yeah. get that on this version like it feel like they're more spacey a little bit more atmospheric but like this mm-hmm. one feels like they're just blistering off his guitar The tone and the the way it comes off on the on the bootleg makes it sound a little different, but yeah, it definitely has a little bit of uh, of extra oomph behind it. And yeah, you are a, a sneaky good song. It it's probably one of my favorite songs on Riot Act now. I have to agree with that. It was definitely yeah. in my top three. I mean, Love Boat Captain's probably not going to be beat, but yeah. I think I would go Love Boat Captain, Save You, and and then you are. Or I think I'm right there. Died. Yeah, I think I'm right there with you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really like this version. And and surprisingly enough, with all the rare stuff in the show, and there's going to be one other song, there are two songs that were tied for the most amount of time that they've gone in between shows. And this is one of them. The last time that they had played it, 23 shows it took for them to play this. Uh, that was the Hawaii show from 2006 that we covered a couple of yep. months ago. Yep, the so end of that tour. Yeah. There's one other song. And you're not going to believe what it is because it's not a song that you would think that would have the longest layoff out of all these songs that are being played. I mean, the next song is You. You's only been played 24 times. That was the 19th performance at this show. You would think that, hey, maybe the, at this point it would have gone like 100 shows without playing it. But no, it, it was only a couple. They they played it one other time that year. So uh, That's 2008 for you. Yep, exactly. You just kind of, it's unpredictably predictable. But here, I, I, I think we have to give this the nod of song appreciation for the week because we really haven't talked about this one a whole lot. universe Pearl Jam that we can go off on uh, about, you know, for, for days and for weeks, for months, like it is one of those songs that in an alternate universe would be a number one hit on the Billboard charts. It's a pop song and yeah. it's a really catchy pop song at that. I think, you know, going back to something real deep that we've done before, another Devo episode that we tried to uh, attribute covers uh, like what bands would work covering other acts for this song we picked taylor swift 
and it makes a lot of sense because it's very upbeat it's very catchy like she can kind of extend her vocals on it and, and it, it would sound really good it's a, it's a pop song you can picture that kind of like dance pop beat behind it even yeah absolutely yep. yeah well, if, if this had been on yield yeah like i could see this getting like mainstream airplay for sure because mm-hmm. it's just like a it's just like a kind of simple love song and i think they they tried to make it weirder with that intro like that right dun, 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 dun. Like it's got kind of that intro the oh this is going to be one of the weird songs but then it kicks in and you're like oh this is i don't think he wrote it in something like 10 minutes or something or uh, one of those that that we've written on the story, but, kind of songs yeah but uh, again you, you've talked a lot about ed on the show and i'll i'll throw that in here too sounds really really good just nailing these these vocals and this is not one that that they play very often first of all but not one that he normally like goes all out on but yeah this sounds really really good and again like kind of in the middle of the song just sort of improving a little bit and uh that you get yours i'll get mine fuck that like just having cool little moments where he can kind of change the song and and i think for people that have been to that this show that's pro there are a lot of little things from this show i feel like people will pick up on and remember specifically this version being from the show i think there was something in corduroy that we forgot to mention that the can't buy what i want because it's peace line was at that the end of that uh that chorus instead of yeah. in the middle yeah. yeah and i feel like that could have been a memorable moment but this for sure like of, of course it, it's a, in the middle of a pop song. He just screams, "Fuck that!" Like that's a great moment. That's, that's yeah. A, he's having they're having fun with it. I can picture him yeah. just dancing around. We don't have video for this show, unfortunately. There's a few scattered around, but Not much, I can yeah. picture him just dancing around and, and going nuts on it. Yeah, and even the drums get pretty insane at the end of the song. Like it starts to it starts to kind of get a little gritty at the end there. That's yeah, a little I like it a lot. This is. I mean, I I don't think this was on my. You know, we going back to the Devo that we don't think this was in my top 25, but it's probably in my top 50 favorite songs. Yeah. That's, that's, that's interesting to think about. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if I'd put a price on it. I, uh, but I, it is grown, uh, on my list. It, the last show that I went to, uh, they played it obviously. And it's one that I don't think I ever expected that I would get, but I was very pleasantly surprised and happy that I got with it afterwards because especially they were supposed to play the other Yield B-side, Leatherman, and then switched it to you. I thought that that was a, a good switch yeah. for yeah. Uh, for the collector and me. So to, to cap off the U series, the U trilogy is who you are. And this is one of those songs I mentioned before. In 2008, there's a lot of versions of it, and it's they're really starting to gel with it again. Like, Matt, I think for the first time, uh, the first show of this tour, they, they busted out, and uh, it's the first time that Matt ever played it, so they're really starting to figuring it out again as a song. They played it, how many more times did they play it this year? They played it seven times in 2008, so this this is an indication that they were really starting to to feel this song, and they were really starting to get something out of it. Yeah, and very cool. You know, something off of No Code that you, you, honestly, a lot of us probably never thought we would get to hear again. Sure. And, and you know, Cameron comes in on this kind of makeshift intro that he was doing, and it sounds pretty good. And, like, they kind of do a, a passable version of it. It's 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 good for what it is. It, you know, it's not... It's always going to be a Jack song, but... Right. It's not, it's not like a hard to imagine where it, it really starts to hit. Like, it's still a little bit tentative, but, again, still good. But my my beef with this trilogy is you've got to go you, you are, who you are. You've got to build on each word yeah. <laughs> as you go. I think that, that really would have nailed it home. I think that's a little bit of a missed opportunity. But still uh, still very cool to get these, these three back to back to back. That's how I feel about the man trilogy. You have to start with nothing and then get to leather, and then better is the finish of that. Hmm, okay. So that kind of that's how it kind of builds, and then you're finishing the set right after the trilogy. You're finishing the set with Why I Go, and uh, I I feel like 2008 is quietly 
why goes real return to prominence because they played it and they kind of makeshift play it in 2003 just to kind of to fulfill all the whole you know playing the discography thing at, at mansfield and they played a little bit in in 2006 but it doesn't feel like it's as prominent as it does nowadays this is like if we're doing the evolution episode on why go 2008 We'll get to it. We got a lot yeah. to do. Like we're the next one we want to do is a yield song. So we're we're progressing through the disc. We've done fourteen of them. So yes, we, we will get seventy four to go. Exactly. Yep. There, there, there's a lot, and it feels like this is sort of the breaking point where this song is becoming kind of a can't miss song in their set where it's becoming one that they can close with that they can have the crowd uh chant the haze in the beginning uh, bounce around to the bass mike furious on the solo like this is starting to become kind of one of the show stoppers uh, at pearl jam shows now yeah and you needed uh, a crowd pleasing song to end this after like like i said three kind of lesser known songs that you might start to lose some people you know your casual fans be like what are these like when are when are they going to play jeremy you know right. so you needed one like this to, to get everybody back to end it in a big way you would already used do the evolution uh we don't get a porch at the show so uh yeah why goes why goes the thing and yeah ending a main set with, with why go it's interesting we haven't had that in a long time and I'm looking at the numbers here. There were 13 shows from this little leg of uh, this little East Coast run here. And I'm looking at three songs that it would, they were played 13 times on this tour. And one, like you mentioned, Do the Evolution. The other one, very obvious, Even Flow. And the third, Why Go. Yeah. Live was played 12. So that's 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 where they stood with Why Go at this point. They were they were ready to kind of put this on the forefront and make this you know catching up for all the lost time in, in the no code and the yield and the vinyl where they that's just completely a, uh, ignored it. That's a good live footsteps catch there. And uh, look, a lot of the the stats that we use, pretty much all of the stats that we use, come from livefootsteps.org. And if you aren't signed up to the website, go and do it. You can look at your own stats and you can look at, at uh, stats from any show and, and see everything basically that we've talked about like how many times a song has been played on a certain tour times that song's been played in between in between shows you can look at all that stuff livefootsteps.org it's a fantastic resource for all of your setless needs so uh that takes us into the encore where we will pause here for station identification talk a little bit more about patreon and ask all of you out there why are you not already signed up to patreon and listening to the hard to imagine episode because that is the sell hopefully we did a good job promoting it to begin the show but we get into so much of how that song started out like like we mentioned the the way that it kind of just started as a germ and then evolved into something that became a recording for verses then it became a different recording for vitalogy then even was attempted as a recording for no code and and in that era although it hadn't been played live it was a uh, it was played in the sound check so you do get to hear some sort of a jack presence in that song so that is probably the most important thing that we got going on on Patreon right now. But, John, uh, let's sell them on the tiers. Let's sell them on what they can get more. I mean, what more do you want than just an hour and a half of talking about Hard to Imagine? That's that's pretty freaking good for just a dollar a month. Like, that's that's good. If if you don't want that, I don't know what you guys want. <laughs> yeah, if you know if you've heard us talking about these kind of episodes and you know the set list drafts and the bridge school things and you know we've we've been doing a lot of times we'll just decide to throw something up there, something for fun, the Devo episodes that we talk about. All that is available for just one dollar a month. You can join up on Patreon as a bonus leg. You get access to all the extra audio bonus content that we put up there. That's all that's all there is to it. You know, twelve dollars a year and you can listen to all the extra stuff that we're doing. And, you know, all, we have a ton of bonus like people. They're all fantastic. It would it would take me too long to go through and list all their names, but they're they're absolutely essential to to what we're doing here. So fantastic job. And I, I hope you guys are, are enjoying all the all the audio content, you know. We just makes us want to do more and more. If if you've heard that and you like you wanna bump up, you maybe feel like 
oh, you know, this is this is interesting. Like, there's there's a show that I went to that I think would be really good for them to cover, but they no one ever talks about the show that I went to. Or there's a really classic show that I think they're missing. They need to talk about that one. Like, then we have we have the five dollar tier, the the giga leg tier, where you can actually request a song for us to cover. You can come on the show with us and talk about it. And uh, you know, we we're, we're trying to cover a lot of those this year. You know, we've had a lot of guests come on this year and talk about shows. We're going to have another one coming up next week. And, you know, we're, we're getting through a bunch of those this year, and that's a lot of fun. It gives get kind of a different feel to the show when, you know, when you guys get to pick the shows instead of us. And then there are the people who are donating $10 a, a month to the show. Those are the people who are helping out with our, you know, website project and really, you know, dialed into the show and really want to support the show and help it out. And we're super appreciative to all those people. You That's the Horizon leg. You get access to all the other stuff. Plus, you're going to get like a kind of an executive producer credit on the website. We'll do a, a profile episode on you, which we've done five or six of those. Those will, those are always great. We get to talk to kind of the our, our Horizon like patrons about their fandom and you know how they fell in love with the band, and you know we we kind of pick a song for them to to pick from their live history to play, and it's a those are always a lot of fun. It, some of them have been kind of super intense and emotional, which was unexpected. So, oh yeah. Yeah, those are those those have been great, and yeah, just just more to come. So those are the three tiers. Like you said, patreon.com slash live on four legs number four, or search for us on the Patreon app, and and it'll pop right up. It's now now's a great time to join in because there's there's a lot of stuff going on. Absolutely, and you mentioned the website, so I think you know we have to mention that next week we are throwing our, our reveal party, our first look for the website for the concerts pedia that we've been working on for the last six months we announced this back in late december what we were doing and that we were going back and we were going to backtrack and do the 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 years that hadn't been covered from five horizons and two feet thick and we were just going to start writing everything and there have been a team of probably about 20 to 25 people that have helped uh write for us and uh really you know we just want to get all the fans perspective on this and uh on the 17th of June, on Thursday night at 9 p.m., we are throwing a party for everybody. Hopefully, there's going to be live music. We're working on that, but there's going to be a reveal. There's going to be a, uh, a special guest, maybe a couple of special guests that we're working on. So, if you want to come, this is the party that... I, we promised for getting to 100 patrons. This is the patron party that we promised, but this is open to everybody. You don't have to be a patron to join this. Anybody can come. Anybody can celebrate. And this is just another, like we did at Christmas, a celebration for the fans. And uh, just want to show you guys what we've been re- really working very hard on uh, getting out there and getting for you guys with this website. So that's June 17th at 9 p.m. It's next Thursday. Please hope to see you there. What you got to do is send us an email, get in touch with us on social media and just say, hey, I want that link on the day on the day of third Thursday, the 17th, the closer that you send us a message on the day of or if you're on Patreon, we will post a link to Patreon. But on the day of send us a note, we will get you that link that will get you in the room. We are probably not making that public, but we will post it to Patreon and we may we may post it in the Pearl Jam podcast community group since it is a private group, but we will not be making that public to our Twitter. We will not be making that public to our uh, public Facebook page. Uh, so if that is something that you want, get in touch with us directly. That should be fun. June 17th at 9 p.m. Eastern time. All right. Back to the rock. And really, you know, in in this era it's kind of a crapshoot you you might get a song that would ease you back into the set but i don't think comatose into sad and to given a fly really eases anybody anywhere this is like okay okay we're we're back let let's go yeah, like keep you it going. had a little bit of a breath and and now really back to the rock so comatose sounds fantastic this is this is the era this is just about the tail end of the era that comatose starts to right after this just kind of takes a dip and and either gets long-winded with it or forgets some lyrics and it's just not on the top of their minds but this version is probably one of the better from the era they played it a ton in 2006 going back this is not a song that we talk about a whole lot but it, it sounds fantastic and the transition in between this and sad 
together. Didn't know I wanted it, but love that we got it. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, this, is, this was unexpected. I kind of had to do kind of a double take. Like, was there even an encore break here? Like, are right. you still going? Like, there's no talking. There's right, yeah. no idea. Yeah, but come out blazing. Come with us into Sad. Very, very good. And yeah, Sad's always great when I can get uh, Mike's solo at the end of Sad is fantastic too where he's kind of he's soloing over Ed uh, singing the last verse of the song and, and that that part is fantastic that just brings the whole element of emotion into the song that just ramps it up a notch very very good version of Sad very very good version of Given a Fly too excellent momentum that you're kind of with these three songs back to back to back here in this encore you know Comatose and Sad are, are very good together and Given a fly, I thought, you know, I kind of mentioned Corduroy and Lightyear as being too fast. Given a fly, funnily enough, funny enough, not too fast. Like, paced very well, sounded very good. And not even, even before, we kind of mentioned that Comeback would be in the set, and there's no, like, emotional speech before that. There's no, like, dedication. It's very rare that you get Comeback, and it's just another song in the set. But here it is in the encore, and, you know, you kind of have to have, like, the wave break a little bit, and this is kind of building back up. Uh, but I don't think I've ever heard a version of Comeback where it didn't attribute to anything. Yeah, normally it has, like, a dedication or at least something to it, yeah. Historically, when you look at the numbers, it's, it's more of a back half song. It's been played 49 times. This is the 23rd performance, so... It's turned into this song that th- that would become sort of the tribute song later on. They would play it at the Ridley shows that they would dedicate it to, to people that have just passed. But it, it is interesting that you're getting this and Light Years at the same show. So you're wondering, is did, did something happen at the time? And, and I know that George Carlin passed away around that time because he mentions it at, at, uh, at the MSG show that came a couple days later. So I wonder if that is what sparks the two performances interesting yeah i don't i don't know yeah that's weird but i mean it's comeback ever been played in a main set it seems like it's always in these yes in these encores if it is it had to have been like penultimate or very late i can't picture it in like early in a main set Oh, I, I, the, no, the Wrigley show is kind of an anomaly, but 2013, yeah. it was in that uh, pre-rain uh, delay section. So, yeah, that, that was the only time that I can think of that it kind of happened in that spot. It was, it was very different because he had a whole speech beforehand and somebody that uh, was supposed to be at the show that couldn't be there. It was, it was dedicated to them uh, that had passed away. So, uh, I mean, but that's like a powerful moment and you mentally preparing for those emotions and and uh you know while this was a very passionate version of the song it kind of had more of an outro than it usually does with ed and mike working right alongside each other very well mike extending things longer than the actual outro usually gives you on this but it it, uh you know without the emotional investment it just kind of becomes another song even though very good performance yeah and then back to the rock exactly right back to back to grievance and uh there's again no talk like it kind of gets off to a rocky start like it it doesn't exactly have that like beginning bite to it like there's some element of it that's missing before it really smooths out kind of in the middle of that verse there but it's binaural song number three of this show that's an interesting note the disparity of albums here just keeps going on like to get sad this late to get who you are in the main set that late like you're still kind of pulling from these albums like here and again the screech in my guitar it's there like that's kind of the defining sound for the show for me definitely and it was i think it was it was cameron who was like a little bit lost it was like come on pick it up pick it up come on and yeah again a little too fast but didn't didn't I mean, Grievance is one that they, they can play too fast. It's not going to hurt it too much. It sounds yeah. really good. Nope. No problems at all. Yeah. Black and Rearview Mirror, it's the second week in a row that we've been lucky enough to get this combo to finish off an encore. And Stone's on acoustic for Black, which I thought was very interesting. And, and Ed, he kind of gets compelled for a second, like he's about to do the unplugged kind of inflection on the kids of Playline. He does like kind of a little bit of it, He's listening to the crowd in this, and he's listening to them respond, and he's 
kind of giving them moments back and forth. He's letting them do the, I'm spinning, whoa, I'm spinning. And, you know, they're key pieces of this that, like I said before, when you listen to this boot, you remember those moments from this show. I feel like a lot of people will remember this version of Black just for a lot of that response and a lot of that back and forth with Ed. Oh, I'm spinning. say that a lot you know whatever this this black is is top 10 top 15 that i've heard of all time like like you mentioned it's got that acoustic feel to it the piano boom's piano is really prevalent and it gives it almost kind of a timeless feel to it like you feel like you're almost listening to like dylan in like the mm. mid-60s or like the stones or something like like a wild horses or a you know you can't always get what you want uh this black is unbelievable Ed, like we, we've talked about Ed this whole show, he's holding that note, the B, and it just, it's just the culmination of, of everything in the show tied into one song. It's, it's near perfect. Like it's, yes, the Unplugged is, is classic. You know, you can talk about, you know, Berlin 2010 and, and blah, 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 blah. This is the one rare song where there's a lot of different sounding versions that can yeah. make it perfect. Yeah. And this one, I thought it, it had the feel, like I said, of like almost like a mid 60s, almost like, you know, the band or something, you know, you had the feeling like it, it had a different feel to it than it normally does, but it no, no less good and no less passionate. And Ed goes off on the, the, we belong together, you know, thought we belonged. And that's always special. It's a, it's a fantastic tag, the improv at the end. And, this just had everything. I mean, I'll I'll go ahead and spoil it. This is my number one moment from the show. This is wow. absolute highlight. One of the one of the best versions of Black I've ever heard. You know, it, it's funny because I actually it, 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 like these two back to back. I love this version of Black, but listening to this version of Rearview Mirror, I'm like, whoa! This is one of the best Rearview Mirrors that I've heard in a really long time. Also very good, yes. Yeah, I was very <laughs> impressed by Rear Free Mirror at the show. I just, it, it feels, I mean, it, it, you have to say something for it just, these songs just having, just taking the moment and making them feel bigger than they are. Making it feel bigger than just being on stage and playing. Making it feel like they're performances that you can hold on to and kind of, take a key element of time and then 40 years later say this is what the 2000s were like this is what music was like or this is the sound of the 90s in its perfected prime and river mirror it just man it just has the blistering fast pace to it which you mentioned there was a blistering version of corduroy and there were faster versions of other songs like light years but like this just ramps up gets to a big moment matt is really setting the tone making it feel huge and then it kind of you know there's a solo in it too it's a legit solo that's happening in the bridge that doesn't happen very often however yeah. i don't know if it's fully a mike solo i think it's i think it's both ed and mike i think ed starts it and i think mike finishes it because it kind of yeah, they're they're all playing off each other. Yeah. Right. It, there's kind of a moment where it sort of 
tapers out a little bit and then you can really hear the sound from Mike and you're like, oh, those two solos sounded completely different and you can hear Stone's kind of rhythmic pattern behind it. He's continuing to doing the same, uh, doing the same thing. But I think Ed gets a little solo in this and that's very, very rare. Up until this point in the show, this is kind of like a cute show. Like, we're opening with Hard to Imagine. We we didn't get through Evacuation. Ha ha ha. We got this I trilogy. Sneak that in there. We got this U trilogy. Ha ha. We're, we're being cute. We're being a little a little tongue-in-cheek. And then and then you get to the song. At the end of the song, Corn just hits. Like, oh, okay. They can just do this mm-hmm. at any time. Like, they can just break out these heavy songs that just destroy you. Like... You, I was not expecting that from this show, you know, and it, yeah, Rearview Mirror, like, again, Jeff comes right in with that bass run right when that jam starts, just like in Black, Ed's going off on the, the Forgive, Forget, and just riffing off of that, and I think the the, the main thing I wrote for this was just, god damn, like, just uh, two spectacular songs in a row, two fantastic performances, two of the highlights. Yeah, upper echelon from the songs that should be upper echelon. Sometimes you, you, you just can take a rearview mirror or take a black for granted when you know you've seen them every single night, night in, night out, especially if you do a lot on these tours, but sometimes you just sit back, just smell the roses a little bit, and just enjoy what you got with this, because uh, these are classics. Core 2, Ed mentions, Ed is talking, 
he hasn't really talked all show, but uh, kind of talks for a minute or so here and says, we've been playing for a number of years at this point. We played a lot of gigs around here. We try to make the right decisions. Sometimes we're right. Sometimes we're wrong. We never know we get this kind of response, but we appreciate it. And even though he wasn't there for it, he didn't think Michael Jordan got this kind of response from the crowd in D.C. So that's a... Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's a random reference, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Washington Wizards era of Michael Jordan that mm-hmm. definitely did not get a Last Dance documentary about it. Uh, but he mentions uh, the next song written after he met Thomas Young. We've talked about Thomas Young before, the soldier that went out to Iraq that uh, thought he was going to Afghanistan and basically lost. Uh, you know, he was paralyzed and uh, it was sent for a wheelchair and had a very complicated life afterwards and Ned has talked about him a lot at this time during this tour he was actually in the ICU he had uh, I think he had an infection and things this was like a turning point for him he started to get worse so uh, Ed mentions he says look you know being this close to the Capitol we got to play this song sing it loud we'll send him a tape Uh, the song they played it a lot on this tour no more it's a solo Eddie song that he wrote uh, you know like I mentioned right after he met Thomas and uh, it, it, it sort of sticks around this era when you think of this song you think 2008 2007 ish and they don't play it nowadays it's not very relevant to our time you know hopefully it will never have to be relevant again but uh you know just you you think back to what was going on and and what people were standing for at the time and it uh it it, it makes a lot of sense and it was good i think this is kind of the rede- the political redemption from the crowd from earlier that didn't really respond to the offshore drilling stuff uh, they respond to this, and they're singing along with it, and uh, Ed, Ed really enjoys this version. Yeah, they even, I think the crowd even keeps going with it after the song's over. They keep mm-hmm. kind of do a little reprise of the outro. They just don't want to stop. Yeah, this is, you know, you know, you know more, like I said, it's kind of stuck in this time. It doesn't really have a, they're all kind of the similar versions, but this is this is probably the best one I've heard. Like, the crowd's into it, Ed's into it. Yeah, it's it, it's kind of everything coming together, and then again, the, it's right the spot for it. DC, you know, they were going to play it. Yeah, uh, not one that I go back to a whole lot because right. I, I saw it a lot very early on in my uh, in my show tenure. So I kind of got bored with it after after a while. But yeah, this one made a lot of sense, and I like the dedication and kind of the the background behind it. So yeah, this this was a very good version. And uh, after after that, they're going to turn around to the back. And they're going to play a song that they hadn't played in 23 shows since the Honolulu Hawaii show in 2006. It's tied for the longest of any song in the show that they've waited to play in between with you are. Can you believe that last kiss? You can say that about last kiss that within all these songs, you who you are hard to imagine uh, evacuation. All of these rare songs that are kind of just haphazardly thrown in this, that Last Kiss would be, at the time, the rarest of the bunch, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they didn't do it in that little European run that they did that we talked no. about. They Not at, not at Vic Theater, not at Lollapalooza, so... Yeah, a little strange, but again, to the back, and we, you know, we, we keep going back and finding these, you know, we keep going earlier and earlier, I think is... 2008 is this the beginning of like playing to the back of the the event the the audience was that they the, did it a couple the, times the in 2003 they did in 2003 okay. they did 2006 but i think it, it's 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 more understood that whenever you do get last kiss that you are going to get it to the back but this one this one felt like it was a different instrument too like it felt like matt was on a different drum set like it has a different feel like a very sparse like just maybe a hi-hat and a snare well and you like know what one it's symbol. you know what i was comparing it to I, I i think it sounds like a bridge school version yeah and that could be like a, yeah a little stripped down yeah yep. a little more acoustic no it's fine yeah behind the back what what can you say so yeah. you got to mention what ed says after as his like the 930 club like that little a little another shout out to the uh the local dc thing there a little small like punk rock club there Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. He's his, uh, his connections to that. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, but crazy Mary here. Uh, I, I, I got a little bit on it and, uh, 
you know, this would be a little bit of a, an evolution episode spoiler, so to speak. But it really feels like listening to some of the 2003 versions, they're getting more acclimated to it. They're getting more accustomed with it. You know, they want to give Boom a big highlight. They want to give him a big moment. And people are starting to notice that. And then... After the 2003 tour, everybody goes out and buys the bootlegs, listens to Crazy Mary, listens to a couple of these songs. They're like, whoa, this is phenomenal. It feels like this, and I don't know, could go back to 2006, but this really feels like an early version where Ed starts to use kind of the vocal inflections here. The, you know, where his dream, I was flying hot, like kind of playing off the song and playing towards the crowd and making it more of a sing along. Because you start to, to feel that the crowd is starting to sing along with these parts too. And it's starting to become a bigger crowd moment than it was back on the Riot, Riot Act tour in 2003 people recognize the song a little bit more and they're they're clamoring for it they know it's a big moment they know something big is about to happen with a boom and mike uh duel but really early on i think the ed stuff in in this i i i think this is one of the early versions where you can say ed's influence in making this kind of a communal like sing-along like uh, crowd connection moment I, I i think this might be one of the earlier versions where this happened Yeah, they were definitely making the song their own. It had become a Pearl Jam song at this point, and, you know, Boom's a big part of that. And like I said, people, you know, you get the booms. Everybody loves doing that. It's a big crowd. Everybody, you know, wants him to, wants to hear him get his chance in the spotlight and hear him do his thing. And speaking of, like, the the B3 sounds amazing on this. A fantastic organ sound. Like, we talked about Mike's guitar sound. The organ sounds, oh, it sounds like gospel gospel church organ and this is fantastic and and the duel between boom and mike is is just super fun you can tell they're just smiling and laughing and pointing back and forth and oh you take it no you take it and just playful and and fun and yeah just a great great moment in the show there was there were some collaborative moments in that too where it was you know both of them playing at the same time kind of sharing the spotlight and then kind of one going off and the other going off and then boom really ends the song boom ends it out instead of mike ending it out and yeah uh, i would say i would give i would give the nod to boom on this i know you usually give the nod to mike but i think this is a boom one i do i don't know i I think i've that hawaii one as i think is the only one that that he gets absolute credit for i think these other ones mike mike's just torn with him yeah, Mike, could, Mike could absolutely bust it out if he wanted to. This is just like I said. This is just a playful one. Like we're just lose. Like we're they're not. Mike's not fully unleashed on this version. But Boom is, and uh, that's that is a special moment for Boom. Oh, and tie it back. Gets the chant right right afterwards. And uh, the way that we end the set is a little bit kind of bread and butter. You want to use some margarine instead then you can call it that but alive into all along the watchtower into yellow lead better and uh strange enough with alive it was kind of it didn't have the vivacious energy that some of the other hits had like you go back to an even flow or a rear view mirror in the set it was a little bit more plotting when it comes to the pacing and comes to just sort of the development of the song, there wasn't a lot. It didn't feel like a showstopper. It felt like, however, it was building towards the showstopper, which I feel was all along the watchtower in this situation. Yeah, that makes sense. I can, I can go with that. I mean, Alive is one where for it to be special, it almost needs to have some sort of weight body. You think of that, you know, Seattle 2000 or the storytellers or something like that, where, you're you're really getting uh, the haze, and you know they're really feeling there's a it's that solo can be super transcendent when when Mike wants it to be. But I mean, you you know you hate to say anything's by the numbers, but there was this was almost just like yeah, like alive. It's it's not the not the big crest of the wave at the end of the show here, like it normally is. It's kind of like you're almost building up to that moment. Yeah, it was almost like a like a place setter. Right. And Watchtower. Yeah. Watchtower is the moment because you got something very special. It feels like with a lot of these that we've we've covered for the deep series, so to speak, we've done shows where where fans have joined them on stage. And uh, last week we we got the dreadlocks shaved off uh, during Brain of Jay. A couple weeks before that, we had uh, the the lyric sheet holder during uh, People Have the Power. And, and now we have a special guest guitar player. A kid named Jake comes out and starts uh starts hammering during watchtower here and and 
just a cool moment to watch the whole entire band just jam with him. Stone gets down on his knees and kind of looks up at him and starts playing up to him and then Mike and Jeff sort of hover over him as well and they have a little jam and, and Ed just kind of looks on he kind of bashes the tambourines together That's a, that was a really cool moment they, they, Jake killed it on that I don't know what Jake's doing now he must have been like 12, 13 at the time maybe a little older I hope Jake, I hope Jake is uh, preparing for a future of, of uh, hopefully opening up for Pearl Jam somewhere someday but uh, uh, he, he made the most of his moment he did a terrific job the mood of the second encore is just very playful and very light like you know the, the crowd's into it you know after after no more you get you know we talked about last kiss crazy mary live it's, they're just having fun they're celebrating the end of the show and yet to anytime you get like a kid on stage you know it's normally we talk about you know ray cameron or you know one of the smart the band's kid but yeah this is this is great anytime you get a special guest like that it's everyone's just having a great time watching everyone's got a smile on their face and yeah, Watchtower sounds great. Absolutely, and then you're ending the set with Yellow Ledbetter. When you're in the nation's capital, you have to end the night with the national anthem. It's pretty much a requirement, and they hadn't returned to D- D.C. since, so hopefully that next show for all you D.C. people out there, you'll probably get a Star Spangled Banner, you would think. But, uh, of course, it's so. Mike just going off and doing his thing and and uh making oh, a feedback final drenched yeah this goes on and on and on mm-hmm. yep it's a very good version of lead better ends your night ends a very good night and uh ends our show thank you for tuning in good night no i'm kidding we have we have <laughs> things to rate and we have uh moments to pick so why don't we uh why don't we do the the second thing first pick your top three we already know what your top one is so uh, yeah. talk about the other two my number three is going to be just the trilogies. Again, a, a cool idea, and I'm and I'm kind of glad that they didn't like make a big big deal out of it. Like, here are these three songs, and here they all have the same thing. It's kind of it feels like, a, like if he would have done that in 2021 in this year, he would have done that. Yeah, if he would have been more yeah. dad about it. Right, but this is that's almost like kind of a cool thing. Like if you if you know, then it's cool and it's cool. But if if not, then okay, it's just these three songs, no big deal. So uh, that's my number three. Hard to imagine is my number two, and uh, yeah, black number one. I am going to say that hard to imagine is probably my number three. I got shit is my number two. I just thought that that ending really stuck out to me. Just especially mad on that, just revving up at the end and and really pounding through. Uh, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go rearview mirror for my number one. And sure. it might sound chalky, but hey, this was a damn good freaking version of rearview mirror. If I ever heard one, which I've heard probably about two to three hundred of the five to 600. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I have heard me a few versions of rear view mirror before. And, uh, this one definitely is a standout. Now we get to, uh, talking about a bit of a rating. So where would you place this on one to 10 scale? Yeah, this is interesting. Cause like I said, this is almost, it kind of had the feeling of like a cute show, like not a great show. Mm hmm. Because you get, like, you know, evacu- evacuation is obviously kind of a, an oops moment. Not great. The But, you know, the, some of, like, the Corduroy's too fast. Light Years is too fast. Didn't really have the same impact that, that you want. It's a, but it's it's a weirdly balanced set list. Like we talked about, you know, equal amounts of Binaural and Riot Act and Yield and 10 and all that stuff. And not only one Vitalogy song, which is a little strange. But they make it like i said once you hit black in that encore it it turns into something special so i I was originally thinking like seven seven and a half for this but i'm gonna i'm gonna bump this up to an eight and a half yeah that's exactly where i was with this uh i i don't think it quite hits the nine territory uh there's just like that there's not a lot of whoa wow moments there's a lot of hey that was really good very excellent moments and i think this is one of those shows sometimes we do ones that it feels like if you were there in person you would like it a lot more than just listening to it on the boot and not having the same attachment so that's where this falls a little bit short but i feel like if i were at this show during this time period it probably hits the nine nine and a half level i think it does get to be that good because people still talk about this show 
maybe oh, it's yeah, because you get to cross a lot off on your stat tracker app if you were there. A- absolutely, and and maybe it's because it's the last one they've done in DC. But uh, people still talk about this one, and I'm I'm right there. I think it's an eight and a half show, which is a very okay. very good, very good show. Yeah. B plus, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that is that is it for our deep series. Hopefully you guys are utilizing the website and uh, utilizing the, the bootlegs from the deep years. Like we mentioned before, it's 2000, 2003, 2008, like we did today, 2013, and 2014, and shows from all of those years, actually I should say, uh, and the lead show from 2014, and shows from all those years we have covered in the last couple weeks. And if you have just tuned into us because of deep thank you and uh you know hopefully hopefully those reviews have uh have convinced you guys to listen to these shows because we work very hard on giving you the best moments and and spotlighting those moments speaking of that like we mentioned before we're doing this party on the 17th if you want to come please email us live on four legs podcast at gmail.com send us a message on social media wherever we will send you a link to get to the zoom party so you can see our write-ups for our brand new concertpedia that's what it's all about we'll have 2018 and 2016 tour years ready for you guys that should be very exciting next week speaking of 2018 right before the day before the zoom party we're going to release a 2018 show believe it or not uh we're going to be doing rio 2018 and we're going to have a guest on uh that is one of our current patrons so he's obviously he was at the show uh but he lives in america so this is going to be an interesting story to see why he he chose brazil to go to he's been to a lot of shows so we'll definitely get some takes from him on that so uh should be exciting rio 2018 and and if you're thinking rio you're probably thinking you know maybe there could be some special guests from the area that could possibly come on and uh maybe keep that in mind because we might we might get a little a little pop in hello so until then we've had fun covering this one we'll be back next week rio 2018 we'll we'll see you then this may be the end we're here but not for much longer and although we may be parting ways i miss you already i miss you always and look if you're not subscribed to us over on apple Podcasts, spotify soundcloud there are too many podcast platforms. You can list, listen to it anywhere, literally anywhere you pick. You can listen to it. And uh, also on Patreon. You can listen to on Patreon if you want. The Hard to Imagine Evolution episode. If you haven't listened to that yet, tune in. It's fantastic. If you listen, make sure you subscribe so you can get the pop-ups for episodes so you know when new episodes come out because you never know when we can just release something out of the blue. It happens. It could happen. But also, we want to keep you up to date and we want to keep you guys listening to the show. If you like the show, rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and uh, leave us a nice little review. We'll read it on the show or give you a shout out on the show. So that's it for this week. We're on to Brazil next week. See you then. Fourth part of the trilogy.